Hello listeners, how are you? We're back here again. This is uh, Charles Scott Sr. and Charles Scott Jr. How are you guys doing today? As you know, well, we're approaching the end of the year. We want to do a recap of what we talked throughout the entire year. I mean, you can go back in our archives, look at all the old episodes, but we'll give you a summary also in this episode today. We can't believe how fast this year yeah, is right? going by. Very fast, <laughs> definitely. We, start, we started out uh, with interest rates rising, uh, inflation being high. Uh, a lot of things have happened. The housing uh, market uh, sort of changing from one degree to another. So we've had a lot to talk about for this entire year. And we're, yes. here we are at the end of the year. And they say things are looking great for going into next year. I will say it looks a lot better for the first time home buyer than it ever has in the last couple of years since post COVID, I'll say. With the interest rates being what there are, what it's doing is making the market be going back to a normal market where the investors, you know, they're not attracted to these higher rates. They want the lower rates. So that gives you more of a competitive edge. When you put your offer on these houses, you can say, okay, I'm not going up against the larger retail, um, I'll say conglomerates and everything like that. And as my son just said, we've been on the you know, uh, air for quite a, bit, quite a long time, I would say, years. You can go back and look at some of our episodes yes. and compare them. Uh, just to give you a little, you know, sometimes we, we get right into the program without giving the audience an idea of who we are. Yes. Because, you know, we get a lot of new listeners and a lot of new viewers. Yes. Because, you know, we actually have been in doing this for a while. I've been in business for 38 years. This is my 38th year. Uh, you've been doing it for quite a while. For about 15 years. And we're both brokers. In other words, the difference between a broker and an agent is the broker, we have a lot more knowledge of the industry. We have yes. a lot more experience, definitely, when you look up and add up all of those years. And we are owner brokers. We own the company. Yes. So we're not just an agent that works for a, a big, uh, what do you call it, uh, franchise. Yeah, exactly. We're personable. We're close by. We, we're, we're, we're out in the field. And we're full time. The reason why I say that is because you have a lot of real estate agents that are part time. And you know they do it on the side. If they so the make, majority of agents are actually part time, and majority of that's them. That's <laughs> why that agent you call them at three o'clock. They can't pick the phone up. They might be at their other job, or they can only show you houses on their schedule, not your schedule. Uh, I'd say in the state of Connecticut, there's probably around twenty-four thousand real estate agents, and the majority of those agents are part time agents. So we're not only full time; we work uh, all the time. Uh, we have our own office. We have, you know, locations in Bridgeport, Waterbury and New Haven Correct. and Naugatuck. My other son is coming into the business also. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have it covered throughout the state of Connecticut if you're looking to purchase a home because, you know, this, the reach of this, this uh, broadcast goes out throughout not only Connecticut, but New York, New Jersey. And a lot of times people are relocating. I'll say a majority of the time. Have you seen the influx of people coming from New York to Connecticut? It means I talk to my customers every day. They're seeing these yellow license plates. You know, they're coming in because they realize Connecticut is right next to New York. Why not keep my job in New York, live in Connecticut, take the train, commute back and forth, and actually save a lot of money on you know my living costs. One of the things that I have on the table for next year, I had hoped to do it this year, was to do a documentary of all of the points of interest in Connecticut and, and our, especially our, our, our market area. Yeah, Fairfield County, Bridgeport. Re yeah, restaurants, schools, uh, and, and put it out there on the internet so that people can get an idea so that when they relocate. In the meantime, you can always call us. You see the mm -hmm. number at the bottom of the screen. You could give us a call if you're planning on relocating to this particular area, we can give you an idea of points of interest, uh, demographics, uh, prices, properties. Attractions, you know. Attractions. The past, I'll say, the last three years in Bridgeport has become an entertainment hub. All right. We have the amphitheater. Oh, yes. We have the you know, Total Mortgage Marina. And we also have the Sound on Sound concert that be become a new tradition to come out every October. They're already planning the one for uh, next year. Yes. The Sound on Sound. I always compare it to uh, Woodstock. Yeah, it's very comparable <laughs> to Woodstock. I, I attended the last one that they had down at uh, Seaside Park. Mm -hmm. There was like, you know, thousands and thousands, thousands of, people. of people. From all the United States. Right. We got the, we got the uh, uh, amphitheater, mm -hmm. attractions that are coming. I mean, world-renowned attractions coming from all over the 
the United States and uh, international. Oh yeah, definitely. So there's a lot, there's a lot of things happening within our, our area and that's why so many people are being attracted and moving into this particular area. You can call us, so we are got a wealth of knowledge on some of the things that are happening here. I myself I belong to a lot of the organizations within the city of Bridgeport and in Waterbury, uh, such as the uh, Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and also serve on the legislative committee. I serve on the political uh, committee. I also serve on the government affairs committee. So there's a lot of different committees that I serve on and so do a lot of Basically what he's saying is, hey, if you want to know about the city, give us a call because he's going to have the insight. He's going to say, oh, this is coming to the city. This is going to be opening soon. So definitely give us a call. Our number's right there. Or for those that are on social media, leave us a comment. We respond to our comments on TikTok, Twitter, Facebook. You know, send us a message. We'll go from there. We wanted to, like I said, give a recap of some of the things. We came into this year with the interest rates rising, with inflation going up, and uh, with the Federal Reserve, they were trying to tame the inflation. Yeah. And where we're at right now, maybe you could give them a little recap as to what, what has transpired and, and, and what direction we're headed in. Yeah, right now, I would say we're at a stability. We're at the point where the Fed has, I guess, hiked the interest rate enough. Was when we know that example from earlier this year where I said you're pouring, pouring the soda, you want the froth to touch the table. Well, the froth's at the top of the glass. We don't want to pour anymore. We're going to keep these interest rates stable for the next, I'll guess, I'm guessing at least, what, at least half a year. I can see these interest rates holding until May, June, because what has to happen now is we have to get back to a normal, stable economy where things cost the appropriate amount of money versus people overpaying or hoarding objects or hoarding inventory, which causes the prices to go up even more. Same thing with houses. People have been hoarding houses at these interest rates. Now they're getting used to them, saying, okay, this is the new normal. I feel comfortable putting my house on the market, which is going to be even better for the first-time home buyers. Also, when you consider that, you look at the rents. You know, the rents have been going higher and higher and higher and higher. And yes. there's also even hope for the renters because you have a lot of the cities, uh, you know, they've instituted uh, rent, rent commissions, rent control yes. commissions. And, you know, we don't know where that's going. But at the same token, at least there's concern out there that everyone's got a, everybody's in the same ship. Yes. You, but with the houses coming on the market, with they'll ease the inventory. Those people that should be living in houses are going to not rent, which, which causes the rent prices to stabilize. Because I will say, since the beginning of the year, rents have creeped up little by little, but I'm starting to see a plateau. And when you have a plateau, you have things start happening. Everybody wants to jump and get ahead of the other person. So mm -hmm. there's going to be more properties on the market. Yes. We definitely feel as though there's going to be more properties and more inventory. And that's a good thing because now mm -hmm. we'll have more people that we can take out, show them the properties. But here's the, here, here, here's the thing that you have to realize. You don't want to wait until How about that? the horses are all out of the corral and now it's a mad fight and multiple offers. Mm -hmm. Now is the time for everybody out there to start getting prepared, Get start prepared. getting your credit ready. Uh, you know, get your get get your paperwork together. Mm. No new cars. We'll give you some don'ts. Don't go out there now and buy a new car. Yep. People say, "Oh, I needed a new car to get to work." Well, you need a car to get to work, not a new car. Go back to September week two. We have a whole episode on how to buy a car with favorable financing or cash if that's what you're looking for, and what to say to the dealer. Don't miss that episode. Mm -hmm. Pay off some of your bills. I know it's towards the end of the year. When you have towards the end of the year, everybody gets in the festive mood and they start spending money like crazy, mm -hmm. the holidays and gifts and, and vacations. That's basically temperate. In other words, don't spend no more than you can afford to pay back. Yep. Now is a good time to set your budget, set your plans, get, get your life in order and say, okay, this is what my wish list is gonna be for the coming year. There's going to be opportunities that are going to be out there because the economy, sometimes you got things that are beyond your control. Oh, yeah, well, some of the things now that may be beyond your control are going to be favorable to you. So if they're going to be favorable to you, then it behooves you to also start making moves that are going to be good for you. Yeah, because you know, on January 1st, you're going to get those newsletters or mailers and emails about the car dealerships saying, oh, that 
you know, your tax return is coming. Isn't it time for a new car? Or the furniture store is going to say, oh, your tax return is coming. We know where you can put it. So remember, why not take that tax return that's coming in January, put it towards, you know, savings for a house or pay some debt down to put you in a better position to get pre-qualified. You know what amazed me last year when I saw where the car dealers were offering to uh, have tax people in their dealerships. How about that? That was well, very you clever. Go, you, can go, you can go in and have your taxes done right in the car dealer. They say, come on, it off to them. come on in, you know, uh, have your taxes done. We have the tax preparer right here. We'll have H&R Block or whoever it is sitting right next to our desk. You come in, you do your tax returns. Oh, that $5,000 you got coming back? Roll oh, that right into oh a new heck. Jeep. We can, we, we can, right now while you're sitting here, let's figure out how, what kind of car you can get with that down payment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before you know it, you've left there and you're happy. Oh, I, I did my taxes and the, the money spent and you don't even know it. <laughs> now, we're not saying buying a new car is bad or anything, but we're saying if your goal is to buy a house this year, I mean, remember, the banks can look at all the new debt you've incurred. And if you have a brand new car, the average car payment right now is around 800, 700 bucks. And the average new car is about $40,000. That's going to be a lot of debt that you don't need if you're going to be buying a house. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, look, Buy the house, every car dealer in the country will be trying to sell you a car. Oh, yeah. Buy the car, and all the mortgage people are running away from you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you got, you, you got, to, you got to set your, pri your priorities. Exactly. Also, with the upcoming year, remember, go back through all our episodes. You can do a lot of research. We have a lot of free information that will put you in a position to become a homeowner in, I'll say, 2024. Because people are going to realize this market is going to become a buyer's market where you have opportunity to have, I haven't seen this in a while, seller concessions. That's when the seller gives you money back to help you buy the house, maybe help you pay your closing costs. We're seeing that starting to happen. And remember, if you're in Connecticut, you've been here for three years, the time to own program. I will say, although I see the funds are getting lower, they've been saying they're gonna refund it. Mm -hmm. Because the governor has committed to, to creating housing. Yes. One, one of the things that you have to realize is that when you have an economy and you have high cost of living, that's not really good in the long run for the state of Connecticut or any state because people have to live somewhere. And if you've got a company and the company relies on workers, the workers have to have a place to live in order to be able to stay within that state or they relocate to another area mm -hmm. where the cost of living is lower. So in order for the, the state to prosper and in order for companies to, to, to build, they have to have workers and the workers have to have affordable housing. Yes. Sometimes the, the, when a company is looking to relocate to a, an area like Amazon or whatever it may be, they look at the demographics and they say, what is the cost of living in that area? Mm -hmm. What is the cost of housing in that area? <coughs> Excuse me. What can the people afford to even go out and spend? Correct. It's called discretionary income. Mm -hmm. After they pay all their bills, do they still have money to go out and spend? You say, what's left over? What can they afford? Can they afford to go on a weekend and shop at the mall? <coughs> and that's the case, they're not gonna build that mall if they know that people can't afford to shop at it. So that's definitely a demographic or definitely a feature that is important when building. So the housing has a lot to do with all of that, you know? We're in a field right now where housing it controls a lot of things. It, it brings the economy up and it brings the economy down. That's why you see a lot of, right now we see, uh, initiatives from the, from, from the Congress all the way down to a local level to pump money into housing so that people can have an affordable place to stay. Exactly, because what we're seeing right now in the builders, what, what are they building? They're building condos, they're building luxury condos, not average condos, mm -hmm. they're building mansions because they're seeing the cost of building has gone up so much. If they're gonna build starter homes, which is what we like to see, they would be breaking even, if not losing money. Mm -hmm. So we need the government to initiate these programs. The other thing you see is, uh, you know, that, that was uh, going back to the beginning of the year. We're giving you a recap of some of the things that happened. Even housing, things evolve. Back when uh, the, the cost of the housing was soaring through the roof, they came out with the tiny houses, the tiny homes, oh, yeah. remember that? Mm -hmm. That's where you could almost buy a house from Amazon. <laughs> they mm -hmm. deliver it, and it's like putting together a doll house. Yes. It's accessory homes, that's what they're called. Yes, we're seeing some of those also being built. You, you, you see 
accessory home is where you got enough land in the backyard of your house you can take and put together a little house and put it in the back of the yard and the mm -hmm. little house has a, a bedroom a living room and a kitchen all built into house. one all built into one mm -hmm. it's got your bathroom your shower there your, your bed folds down you fold the bed back it turns into a couch <laughs> yeah we're seeing that they're passing a lot of laws a lot of people to build that because I mean, they're not making any more land land is pretty much built up so they need to take advantage of all this extra land in people's backyards why not build an accessory home i believe there's some rules to it i think it has to be an in-law correct or someone that yes. has lived there but i mean as those rules change i can see it becoming a regular rental right you have a lot of the uh, and most of the apartments that are being built are one and two bedrooms yes one and two bedrooms because they don't build the one and two bedrooms you know enough there's a lot of people a lot of demand we have a lot of people call us mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of people are coming in single nesters you know people that yes. that aren't getting married and having as many children so there's mm -hmm. not a demand there for three bedrooms and, and, and right now a rarity is to find the four bedrooms oh yeah four bedroom five bedroom those are harder to find very hard to find why because if you have a four bedroom or a five bedroom most people are not giving them up exactly because they need them Mm -hmm. And the only time that they give up a four or five bedroom usually is when they go to buy a house because they've got enough children in that four bedroom that yes. now they need a bigger place and so they, they go out and they buy a house. Mm -hmm. I will say that's why I see most when you see a larger apartment vacate is because the person bought a house. Could be someone passed away or maybe someone got evicted. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is a lot of people are still out there looking for uh, uh, investment, rehabs, uh, foreclosures. Well, every, well, how many calls do we get a day? Oh, ton of calls. All the investors out there, you know, that if you're listening to this program, yes, there's a big demand out there for foreclosures and, 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 and rehabs. I had a lady call me the other day and she said, Mr. Scott, if you can find me a house that's not completely finished, maybe someone started building it and they stopped they stopped, uh, you know, building it and, and, and they didn't finish it. And if I can buy that and finish it up and then I could rent it out or sell it. And, I, and now you got to realize the same woman we've been looking for a rehab property for her for the last uh, two or three years. And so I said to her, well, that's the same thing as a rehab. There's no difference whether it's half finished or it's still considered a rehab. <laughs> that's the same thing everybody's looking for. Everybody's looking I'm, for it would reply to her i'm looking for that too let me know yeah <laughs> let me know where is it i'd like to buy it too. half finished house that's great <laughs> a lot of people are looking for a half finished house yes definitely you, you know it used to be used to be you know we we we've given tips and that's you know since we're recapping mm -hmm. we've given tips to people about how to find rehabs and what to look for yes uh, if you're driving down the street and you see a house and it's got grass two feet tall if Newspapers you, piled up, mail piled mail up. Mail piled up on the porch, uh, the, the window boarded up, uh, you know, uh, you look and you see all the leaves piled up. What's the first thing they should do when they see a house like that? Well, call us. Call us. So we'll help you out. <laughs> call, call us. You know, we can do some research on that property. Definitely. We can, you know, and we get that a lot too. Ms. Scott, mm -hmm. I saw this house, it was all boarded up just last week. Remember uh, that? Mm -hmm. The gentleman called me last week. And he said, there's a lot of furniture in the backyard. This is a, this was a, I think it was a two or three family yes, house. Yep. And he said, uh, this is, there's a lot of furniture in the backyard and I see it's been accumulating there and there's no action going on. Mm -hmm. And you know, can you find out what's going on with that house for me? Like we thought, we looked it up and so, gone through foreclosure. In my mind, I'm thinking to myself, okay, what, one of two or three things can be happening with mm -hmm. this house. There's nobody living there. There's furniture in the backyard. Maybe mm -hmm. it was an eviction. Uh, maybe it was a fire and they threw stuff out. Mm -hmm. Maybe the owners abandoned it. So I'm thinking it's not normal to go buy a house and just see furniture piled up on the back and, yes. and it'd be vacant. So you, there's there. Sometimes it's too good to be true where someone just had a very low mortgage and just decided to leave the house. Things like that just really don't happen. It's mm -hmm. got to be a distressed situation. Exactly. And what is the di distressed situation? In that particular case, the, 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 the people that lived there had refinanced the house. Mm -hmm. So they, got a, they originally started off, the mortgage was only like $150,000. So they refinanced the house for 300 and some thousand. Mm -hmm. So that means the bank gave them money on the house. Then and eventually they didn't pay the mortgage. 
but they still had the money, remember? Exactly. So they had the money, they took the money and they moved out of the country, mm -hmm. to the back to their home country. <laughs> but remember, they had all of the money from the refinance that they pulled out of the house because they had equity. Mm -hmm. But now they got a big mortgage on the house, so now the bank is stuck with the house, but there's a big mortgage. So if you or I wanted to go buy that house, the bank would say, hey, they owe like $350,000. So give us $350,000 to buy the house from us. How about that? And so that might not be a good deal because mm -hmm. even though it's vacant there, they took and borrowed so much money on that particular property, mm -hmm. unless the bank is willing to sacrifice and sell it at a big loss. Which but is, the bank doesn't have to. Which is called a short sale. Remember, when right. people are selling a house, it's called a short sale. You see a lot of advertisements, people saying, you know, short sales this, short sale that. Remember, that is kind of like an oxymoron. It's not a short sale. It is, I'd say, a lengthy process because you had to convince, you know, creditors to give up equity and say, okay, the bank gets first dibs. But remember, a short sale is a process of the bank selling the house at a loss. And a case like that, though, <clears throat> what looks like a good deal Look at it this way, the bank is kind of smart. The bank is going to put that property out there at top dollar mm -hmm. because now supply and demand, everybody wants that house. Mm -hmm. So therefore they're gonna end up getting what they want because the price of the house is gonna go higher and higher and higher and higher. It would be nice if you could come and buy that property for $150,000. Oh yeah, definitely. But I guarantee you they're gonna get th over three, 350 for the house because everybody's still gonna wanna buy that house. It's just that the other people, they got the money that they pulled out of it, so they're gone, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean the bank is really gonna lose that much. The reason why the bank makes out is because the values have gone up. That's true. There's <laughs> a lot, I've been reading articles, a lot of houses right now, the bank is hoping these people get foreclosed on because they realize that there's so much equity in these houses, they can actually make more money with the person losing the house than the person keeping the house and paying on the loan. So that's what we're seeing out here a lot of. Right. But because the rents are high, it's a good deal to go out and buy a house right now because, again, we've always said one thing. What's the alternative? To pay high rents and end up with nothing. Mm -hmm. you, end up, you end up with nothing. Why is that? Because when you're paying rent, you're paying 100% interest rate. No one says that out loud. What's 8% compared to 100%? Why not get a mortgage? At least some of that bank, that money you're paying every month is going into savings. Mm -hmm. And... Start making friends with all your relatives or making friends with your sister and brother because you may want to join together with them and buy a house. All right, go back <laughs> to the episode in October. Remember, treat your, I mean, might sound a little stern, put your friends and relatives to a credit check of your own. Pre-qualify them. Maybe you shouldn't be going in business with certain relatives and certain um, family members, I'll say. Make sure, look at their track record. Have they lost any cars in the past three years? Have they been through a foreclosure? Make sure you say, okay, maybe this is someone I shouldn't be going to business with, or maybe it's someone I should be. Do a credit check. Yes. You know, it's, it's like that commercial on TV. If you're getting married, make sure you do a credit check on your spouse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was that, that, that uh, I can't, I'm not going to mention the name of that company, yeah. but where, where, where the couple got married and the, and, the, and the husband had very bad credit or the wife had very bad credit and, and then they found out they couldn't do anything and he said, I should have used the credit check yeah. before we got married. You go to, the, you go to the, the pastor before you get married and he blesses it. Now you go to the credit bureau and the credit bureau blesses the wedding that? before you get married so the you know, credit credit actually you know mm -hmm. uh, rules a lot of things that you do but remember when you going to buy a house with someone it isn't a matter of who owns 10 percent versus 20 percent you own the house 50 50 with that person so any decisions going forward requires both signatures some people may not realize that so make sure if you do go to buy a property with someone it's someone that you trust and you both have the same goal in mind. Some people may want to buy a house to sell. Mm -hmm. What if someone wants to buy a house to live there for the rest of their life? That's a conflicting interest right there. Mm -hmm. Well, just you know, piggybacking on what, you're, what you said there, we have a lot of people out there that come to us to sell a property that they only own half of. Mm -hmm. Because what they've done is they've either co-signed for something or either they, joined, they, bought, they bought it together and now they want to sell it 
not realizing that the other person that's on the deed owns half the house. Yes. So you don't want to go into a partnership or go into ownership with someone to buy a house and then all of a sudden get them upset with you mm -hmm. and, and have an argument with them and throw them out and say, this is my house. Well, if their name is on the deed, it's half of their house. Exactly. So now when you go to sell the house, they are actually entitled to half of what you've done because mm -hmm. they're 50-50 they're, they're on the deed. If something happens to one partner half, and, and, and you're not married or even not related, the way the deed may be written up is that half of what the, of the house goes to their, their family. Yeah, people may not realize that. They may be, there might be some situation out there where someone's owned the house if they're maybe an elderly person say, I'm just waiting for him to pass away and I'm gonna get the house. Remember. They have heirs. It has a, there's a certain order that probate works with, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't just get the house outright. Mm -hmm. Well, if they have a, a spouse, maybe they have a grandchild or kids. Remember, there's a, what's it called? Probate. Probate. Everyone must, must go through probate, must go through an estate. You know, you just made a good statement there. Realize this. I always tell people, you can only give away what you own. Mm -hmm. So if you own a house, and not own it, People say they own it, that's because yeah. they live in it and they have a mortgage. But in case something happens to you, you can't give the house to someone else if there's a mortgage on the house How because you don't own the house because it hasn't been paid for. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, if there's two or three heirs, the house has to be sold. And if there's a profit, the profit is to be split up amongst the people that are left behind. Mm -hmm. You see so many people say, oh, if my aunt passes away, I get her house. She promised me I can have the house. Or, she, or the other one say, oh, yeah. and, and I was promised a car, and I was promised the land that she's got down south or whatever it may be. If those things aren't paid for, they don't realize that. you can get promised anything in the world, <laughs> but you're not gonna get it until it's paid until for. It's paid off. And if it doesn't get paid for, they're gonna, the bank that gave out the mortgage is gonna take it back. So take you, it all back. you end up with not only with nothing, you may get a letter from the attorney saying, you owe me money for doing the probate. How about that? So realize there's no guarantee that anything is coming to you unless it's paid for, mm -hmm. you know? So like I said, it's been a lot that has happened this year. We recapped on a lot of things. Uh, you got the income tax coming, hopefully. You got some money we're coming. Gonna, we're going to check on them in January about the income Make tax. Make a New Year's resolution. You're going to get your life in order. You're going to pay off your bills. You're going to get your credit straight. You're going to build up some wealth and equity for yourself in the future, your get retirement, house. your children. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, get all of that. What is it? The, your resolution together. Yes, and yes. Stick to, and we're going to make sure you stick to it because we're going to keep coming in and pounding on you and pounding on you the, the importance of building wealth. Yes, yes. We're not going to not pound it on you. It's free access <laughs> well, it's here. It's you free. Know. <laughs> look at TikTok, look at Twitter. Remember, we're not only just talking about real estate, we're talking about you know, t things in general. So definitely, we hope we have a great new year. Happy holidays, everyone. And do you want to send off? No, I just want to say that, you know, again, uh, all of the things that we're saying is for the well-being of you, mm -hmm. your family, we wish you happy holidays and a fruitful year coming in, especially for the new year coming in. And if there's anything that we can do to help, you see our number there, review some of our past episodes. And yes. until next time, God bless. Amen.